in this story, which is we've often titled The Wise and the Foolish Builders, Jesus is pointing to a fundamental truth about what it means to have a life built upon Jesus Christ. And he uses this illustration of a house built on a firm foundation or a house built upon the sand. How many of you, whenever you hear this, this story about the wise and the foolish builders, automatically go to this childhood song that you might have sung in Sunday school? The wise man built his house upon the... You know that one? And what's our favorite part? Unfortunately, the favorite part is the bad part, right? And the house went splat, right? We have these memories, uh, those of us who grew up in Sunday school, of these songs. These songs, though, are fantastic because they cement in our minds the truth of the scriptures. That there is a fundamental principle that's at work in the life of a believer. The question that we ask ourselves is, what is your life built upon? Now, how many of you saw the question that was on the screen during the transition? Something about a sport that you think you might be good at even though you've never tried it? What does that have to do with this? Well, it has to do with this psychological principle that happens when particularly middle-aged men are sitting in front of a television watching professional athletes on a screen where they see these athletes competing at the highest levels and they have all kinds of good advice that they would freely offer to that athlete if they were there in the room with them. What, you didn't see that opening? Oh man, you should have cut back that way instead of that way. All you had to do was jump over that guy and you would have made it all the way to the end zone. There's also this particular phenomena that has been studied by psychologists in which there's this this idea that every middle-aged man, and I'm pointing right at myself, watching Olympic athletes thinks to themselves somewhere in the back recesses of their mind, you know, I could probably do that. (laughs) The reality is that when Someone like me tries to run a race against someone who has trained their whole lives for it. It looks pathetic, doesn't it? Why? Because I haven't put in the work. I haven't done the training. And more likely than not, I'm going to blow out a knee or something. And it's going to end very badly for me. So why is it that we have this feeling like, oh, I could do that. I'm just, I'm just a couple reps away from breaking a world record myself. It's because we think of ourselves as being better than we actually are. We live often in a delusion that we have enough strength. We have enough resources. We have the gifts that it takes to be the best. The story that Jesus tells here is in the context of teaching about what it looks like to be a person whose faith is firmly founded on something immovable, something that will be sustaining through times of trial. The context for this story is that this is in the land of Israel, Those of you who have visited Israel or those who have seen pictures of it, you will know that in Israel you have two building material options. You have stones and you have sand and not much else to work with. When you build your house, what do you build it on? The other thing that happens in a land like this that is arid and dry is that when there is rain, it doesn't just soak nicely into the ground. It comes in a rush of a flash floods and beats against anything in its way and tears it down. 
The image here in this story that Jesus uses is of our lives and the reality that when we live in this world that there are times when storms come and rage, that there are floods that come up and rivers that rise and beat against the walls of our house. And how we have built that house will determine whether we stand firm and are safe or whether we are washed away by the circumstances we find ourselves in. The difference between real, solid faith and a superficial appearance of faith is found in one thing and one thing alone. The relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. This morning I'd like to take a liberty here of building off of, get building, building off of this parable, off of this story, and extending the metaphor of construction just a little bit further as we consider our own lives in our own context. There's a number of things that can go wrong when we try to build a house or build something in our lives. There are some very common mistakes that we see all around us. One of those mistakes is using shortcuts or a lack of preparation for the work that needs to be done. Another is to use the wrong contractor. And a third is that we might use the wrong materials. So let me talk about what each of these things means to me in this context of building our house wisely. When we build, sometimes we are tempted to use the easiest or what seems to be the simplest path forward. Rather than doing the hard work of digging down through the what's on the surface, getting rid of and clearing out all of the weak and bad and shifting materials in our way, to get down to bedrock, to something solid. In this parable, Jesus talks about the sand. Sand feels firm until you have a moving current. And then what happens? It melts away. Sometimes in our lives, we try to build a structure, a relationship, something of value on a foundation that has not been properly prepared. For example, one of the things that I have the privilege of doing as a pastor is walking with couples that are going into marriage preparation classes as they prepare to wed their lives to one another and begin this new life together. One of the things that I say to them over and over again is that if you want your marriage to be solid, if you want this to last in all of the storms that life brings you, then you need to make sure that you have shared all of who you are with one another. The good and the bad, the present and the past. Because if you just try to forget about the past and not actually reveal who you actually are to one another, share with one another in a vulnerable way about some of the mistakes that you've made and some of the things that have happened in your life, then what you are building on is a false foundation. And we all know that at some point in our lives, the truth always comes out. And if we have tried to hide parts of our past, if we have tried to pretend to be someone that we are not, When that is revealed, particularly in a relationship like a marriage, the marriage will often fracture and fall to the ground. And the damage and destruction that it causes is so great. In our lives of faith, 
To build on a firm foundation means that we must clear out the things that lie between us and the firm foundation of the bedrock of Christ. This means that our faith is built on the concept of true repentance and confession before God and before our brothers and sisters in Christ. So that the old is gone. So that which was built on my false self, that which was built on my broken self, is taken away and I am firmly building on the truth of God and who I am in my identity in Christ and the life of faith that comes with it. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, that the cornerstone of our faith and the cornerstone of our life is Jesus Christ himself. And that when we build on that foundation, it will stand. There is no shortcut that will get you there. A shortcut and a lack of preparation in your spiritual life, in your remarriage relationship, in your workplace, in whatever it is that you seek to do will eventually cause destruction. Using the wrong contractor. I have a lot of skills. I live in a hundred year old house that needs constant work and upgrading and fixing. And I, like many other people, think I can do it myself. One of the mistakes that we often make in our lives is that we take a DIY DIY approach to life rather than leaning on the advice and expertise of the qualified professionals. Let me give you an example. In the first home that Kathy and I lived in, after we got married, when we moved in, we realized that there was an electrical outlet in the office that didn't work. Well, there were plenty of other outlets, and so we just used those until one day when I was in renovation mode and we needed to fix up some other things. It's like, okay, I should actually figure out what's going on with this outlet and see what's going on, and I can fix it, hopefully. Or if I can't fix it, at least my dad knows what's going on. I can call my dad, and my dad can come and help me, and we'll fix it, and then this outlet will work. Well, I unscrewed the, the outlet plate, and then I unscrewed the outlet itself and I pulled it out of the wall. And I realized, oh, well, quite clearly this isn't working because there's only one wire attached to it instead of two. Well, that in itself is a simple thing to remedy. Until I realized that the second wire was there, just not attached to the outlet, but rather resting on the two by four next to it with a nice black Scorch mark. Whoever had installed that outlet previously didn't know what they were doing and just about burned down the whole house because of it. This is a simple illustration, but it's one that we don't really think of necessarily in our personal and spiritual lives. One of the things that we do so often in our spiritual lives is that we think that we can do it ourselves. I think I know enough about how to do this that I'm just going to go ahead on my own thinking, my own experience, my own heart, my own feelings, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit in my life to guide and direct and speak truth. One of the ways that we see this over and over again is when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture and what it is that we ought to do in our lives. And where we take my experience and the things that I see and that I understand about the world around me and we take that experience and we try to put it on top of the Scriptures and read the Scripture through my experience so that whatever 
understanding I get from the scriptures comes out of who I am. The problem is, is that I can only see this much. It's not that I have only limited knowledge. It's also that my experiences and my past and who I am also distort and color the way that I read scripture. To read and understand the scriptures and to know what God requires of us takes intentional, deliberate attention to the voice of the Spirit in our lives and in the context of the congregation of the gathered believers who interpret together. It's not down to me and my own understanding. There's a famous proverb, Proverbs 3, verse 5, that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding goes on to say that when you submit to his ways, you will find that the path before you becomes straight. We must set aside when we don't understand and learn to trust that God knows more than I do. His spirit will lead us. In Jeremiah 17, verse 7, The prophet says to the people of Israel, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And then he goes on just two verses later to correct this misunderstanding that so many of us have. He says the heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You've heard the phrase over and over again in our world, trust your heart. Go with your heart. Your heart is fickle and changes from day to day. What does not change, what provides a firm foundation is the word of God and the Holy Spirit that guides us into truth. The third mistake we often make is using the wrong materials. Choosing to use a couple small nails when in reality we need some big heavy bolts to hold things together. Or using just what you have on hand instead of going out and and purchasing the right material. Or even worse, just buying the cheapest one you can find rather the one that has quality and strength to it. We have a very tragic example of this in our world just not too long ago. There was a serious earthquake that shook Turkey and Syria. It was a strong earthquake, yes. But when that earthquake hit, apartment building after apartment building collapsed completely, trapping and killing thousands of people. The earthquake, though it was strong, was not strong enough to cause all of that damage. What came out in the following weeks was the the truth that was revealed that the builders had used shoddy workmanship and shoddy materials so they could make a buck in the end. And the result was a tragedy of immense proportions. When we build our lives with shoddy materials on an appearance of righteousness rather than on righteousness itself, we are setting ourselves up for destruction. There is a big difference between going to church on a Sunday morning and entering into worship of our God together with the people of God. There is a difference between Settling for a simplistic catchphrase about our faith instead of being immersed in the scriptures and reading and being wrestling with what we find there and listening for the Spirit speaking into our hearts. We settle for things like saying, Oh, well, God will forgive me. God forgives. And we deny the cost of grace in our lives. That forgiveness comes at the cost 
of the blood of Jesus Christ. God loves everybody. Yes, he does. And in, but when we just live on that catchphrase, we deny the holiness of our sovereign God who has a will and a purpose for each one of us and desires that we turn to him. When we say the Bible clearly says, we ignore the complexity of applying those truths in our time, in our day, in our context, and the work that it takes for us to do that together. When we say, God won't give you anything you can't handle. It's not true. This life will throw things at you you can't handle all the time. The only way that we are able to handle it is because the Spirit of God is the one who gives us the strength. The Spirit of God is with us, upholding us and walking with us. The way that we get there is through consistency, practice, training our spirit until it becomes a part of our character, part of who we are, rather than something that we do where we are righteous children of God. Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he came to the city of Corinth, challenged them, and he said, when I came to you, I didn't come proclaiming about the testimony of God to you with superior speech and wisdom and all of that extra stuff. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and in fear and with trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not made with words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and his power. So that your faith won't rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Our lives must be built on one thing and one thing alone, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. As we read in the parable today, Jesus says, come to me. Which means to approach him in repentance and humility. And he says, hear my words. Which means to set aside ourselves, to receive the spirit of God and to listen attentively, to read his word, to study his word, to pray and to be immersed in the presence of God through his Holy Spirit. And then he says, to act on what I say. To do the work that needs to be done, setting a firm foundation, relying on and trusting in God's will and power for you in your life, and to remain in the presence of God, whether it's in worship, whether it's in service through your gifts, or whether it's in your daily life. And in this way, we build our lives on the rock that is Jesus Christ. And when the storms come and the waters rise, we will stand firm. Amen? Amen.